Hi, my name is Michael Nannery. This is my exhibition, Aquariums. Um, it's in partial fulfillment of my MFA studio degree. Uh, it features a variety of art forms as well as aquarium systems that are combined to create a multi-sensory environment that will hopefully allow the viewer to have their own personal experience of um, aspects of the fish keeping hobby that I'd like to share. So, you know, the thing that really struck me about the two shows I've seen of yours, this show and then the one last year, mm -hmm. um, the large sort of indoor nature-ish installation, um, is as you are now, you're in both shows. Uh, obviously, there is lots of work where people install something and then they leave the room. And obviously, there's lots of, you know, performance work where the body of the artist is the work. Mm -hmm. But you're not either of those. You're kind of like the curator sort of a little bit off to the side you're you're ever present but not overbearing and yeah i mean i i have a relationship to the fish in that sense like it's it's my role to be their caretaker and over the course of the week i've just been performing the various actions um, that are necessary to keep the fish alive so I wouldn't say I have like, you know, a super active role in this, but I am like with, without my presence, um, these aquariums wouldn't continually function because there needs to be somebody to turn it on and to like remove the waste and to feed the fish. So um, I, I kind of am a, a presence in this show just because like in order to keep fish, you need a, a human to keep them. So, yeah. So they're domesticated. These ones are, are very domesticated, yes. Um, do you want to walk around and point anything out of interest? Sure. Um, I, I guess goldfish themselves, um, they're an extremely domesticated fish. They, they um, are derived from the Crucian carp, which comes mainly from the Lower Yangtze River in China. But um, there's hundreds of different breeds of goldfish that exist in the uh, particular goldfish species. And those have all been like bred out over like 1,500 years by, by breeders. Um, so they'll find aesthetic traits that they find to be appealing, like the egg-shaped body or like certain colors. This one's missing um, a dorsal fin, and that's like a desirable trait. Uh -huh. So this, this is a lion head goldfish, egg-shaped body, lack of a dorsal fin. This is a shibuking. It's a Japanese breed of goldfish, um, just like longer, more flowing tail. Um, so this is a very like aesthetically bred out fish, and typically they use like inbreeding to achieve those certain traits. Um, fish that have been bred out like that, they lack the vitality that like your common 15 cent goldfish would have. So these are actually much weaker fish. They're kind of more susceptible to diseases and they, they are always outcompeted by the um, common goldfish whenever food is added to the aquarium. So, so fashion has a price. Fashion does have a price. But, um, I mean, they're adorable, though, so, <laughs> you know, I, it's kind of the same for, like, dog breeds, how, like, certain dog breeds are actually have very poor health because they've been bred that to look a certain way to achieve, like, cuteness or some other desirable attribute. The same holds true for goldfish, as well as, like, numerous other kinds of aquarium fish. And do you think that's some fundamental quality of, is, is there some ethical overtone that, that, you, that, we're, that we're playing God, or is it just that our technology is not that refined yet? Um, I mean, this is something we've been doing, like, since humans ha have been on the earth, like, cultivating the land, like, you know, crops as we know them today have developed that way, like, you and I were having a conversation about corn yesterday, and corn is just derived from just grass, and it's just gra like a mutant grass that was continually um, like planted and developed over the years. So, you know, humans have been like sort of tinkering and morphing our the environments around us 
for you know thousands and thousands of years so this isn't really anything that's too new um, I would say that with the advent of aquariums um, like different types of breeding has emerged and it's it's been happening much quicker like technology is certainly one way to like achieve that um, you know genetic modification tells us anything yeah I mean you can't help but wonder what what genetic marvels horrors or whatever uh, <laughs> you know are, are around the corner yeah um, for fish as I suppose for for humans as well mm-hmm um, I mean, the idea of having of, of you or I having a, a tail maybe seems a little crazy today, but I'm sure when they're available um, soon, then a lot of people <laughs> might want them. I don't know. Yeah, it d depends how cute and furry you can make them, I guess. Yeah. So, is, uh, what else should we look at? Um, I guess we could just sort of walk around okay. and look at the uh, various systems themselves. Um, I kind of have a range of aquarium systems I'm keeping. Some of them are extremely simple, like this is essentially a large goldfish bowl where I have to clean out the waste every single day. Um, the uh, aquarium over there is also the same. I just have my male goldfish in that tank and my female goldfish in this tank. Uh -huh. um, but I have other aquariums, like some that run on um, filters that both filter out like the waste and allow like bacteria to grow in them and I typically only have to like clean an aquarium like this out once a week um, but I'm, I'm really interested in like the role plants have as like water purifiers and just kind of as great tank mates for the fish themselves um, one of particular note would be the marimo which it it's a kind of algae. I can reach in there and grab one, actually. So this is like a, a kind of algae that grows in, in a... So that's not uh, on top of a rock. It's, it's, it's all algae. Yes. It's, it's like a furry... It's an algae ball. ball. <laughs> um, and now that I've squeezed out all the water, it'll float on the surface. Or maybe not. But um, the fish like to hide in it. But basically, like this, just it's just little algae filaments that, in the wild, it, it exists on the bottom of lakes, and um, the ocean or the lake currents um, form it into the ball shape. In aquariums, um, keepers will like roll them into the ball shape by hand. Um, but yeah, they grow about five millimeters a year in like the wild. Um, they can grow up to like a foot wide. Oh, so that's a pretty old ball then. Yeah, it takes like a hundred years for it to get that large. Wow. Um, but, I, you know, in an aquarium it would take many years for it to be very big, but, uh, you know, it, it, it'll happen eventually, unless my goldfish eat them first. So, <laughs> we'll see. But, um, yeah, speaking of like that range, like I'm interested in like plants and like the marimo, like the other plants I have, um, have a role in like filtering out the fish waste. And one of my like more complex systems is um, this aquaponic unit, which combines hydroponic growing of plants with aquaculture, the, the raising of fish. And um, essentially what happens in this tank, which unfortunately there are no fish in it, it's actually uh, the water is flowing right now, so this would be a really good shot in the mirror this way. But um, water is, is coming down, like draining out of the bed. Got it. So essentially this grow bed, um, for 10 minutes, um, water will be pumped up from the aquarium, like from the submersible pump, up through PVC, up to the top of the grow bed out of these spouts. And it takes about 10 minutes for this to fill up and one minute for it to flush. It uses what's called a bell siphon to cause this flushing to happen. Um, there's a standpipe, so the water will fill up to this level and this bell siphon goes over top of it. 
What you see here is a media guard. Um, this keeps all of the hydrotin gravel, which I grow the plants in, from falling into the plumbing system. But once the water reaches this height, um, a vacuum will form, causing um, water to be like pulled underneath it, and um, the water will like gr rapidly fall up until it hits these openings and the air disrupts the vacuum and it disengages the flushing. Um, so essentially like the fish waste, as you feed the fish they poop and then their poop becomes fertilizer for the plants up top. So the bacteria and worms that live in the grow bed break that down for the plants who then filter out the nitrates for the fish. But um, yeah, bacteria is kind of like the uh, the glue for the fish and the plants, I guess you could say. So this is your uh, MFA thesis show. Yes. And um, so what might you be doing in the future? Will there be more aquariums or you'll be, you know, where, what kind of future interests do you have? Um, well, I haven't been doing this for too long, so I'm going to keep developing the systems that I'm working on. Like, I need to restart this aquaponics system because a pathogen got into it and wiped out my fish. So I need to restart this and try some other things. Um, I'm working on, like, planted aquariums that, like, I'm working, trying to get the water chemistry right with those, seeing how I can develop them. Um, as well as like finding outlets for like the waste material itself. Like when I remove the waste, I collect it in buckets and jugs labeled poo water, which then I return to, I pour it into my garden or I give it to friends of mine um, to, you know, water their plants with. Um, so yeah, I mean, the plan is to just sort of keep developing these things. And um, they didn't, they will be all in my personal residence after this show. Like I had about half of them in my studio and half at home, but I'll just be kind of living with these um, after this show and just continually developing them. And I'm excited about the fish once they like finish, you know, it'll five years or so when they're much, much larger. That's, that's something that I'm looking forward to, so. Just continuing to keep them and so to... it's a long-term uh, project. It is. It's, it's meant to be a very long-term project. Um, so I, I can't wait to see what these fish are going to be like when they're fully grown, because most are kind of in their juvenile states. Um, and just like, um, I guess it's, it's been kind of like philosophical for me, thinking about like, you know, all of these inputs and outputs of the tank and how to maintain them. And, you know, what, what am I supposed to do with all of this, you know, poo water that's essentially a waste. But um, figuring out how that works with, within their own ecosystems and with, like, other ones, like... Um, so, so much of our, of our Western consumer life is, is ecosystem-less in, in the sense that when I go to the McDonald's drive through on my way to school, I don't know where that food comes from or what it is, and, and the, mm -hmm. the waste is to crumble it up and toss it. And, <laughs> and so neither kind of the origin, the origin nor the destination is, is really part of my system. It's just drive through, get some calories, keep driving. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm interested in connecting as many things as possible. Like, I'm using the, the aquaponics unit here to sort of, the plants act as like an air freshener. They're just indoor plants that don't require any sort of grow light. So they, they kind of do a good job detoxifying the air. Um, so in a sense, this is kind of a big air freshening unit, but aquaponics is, um, it's really most popular among the do-it-yourself and grow-your-own-food movements. Um, and they're interested in like growing vegetables and growing edible fish, such as tilapia or catfish or trout. Um, so for them, it, it's like, you know, this simple process, which can vary depending on what containers and materials you use. Like, it's all, um, you know, there's about a million different ways that you could do it. Um, you know, they're interested in producing food from fish keeping. And, you know, that's something I'm, I'm also interested in. I mean, I'm, I'm growing food with the poo water that I produce, um, just like some carrots, radishes, kale, stuff like that. But, I mean, I'm not like a hardcore gardener yet. <laughs> but who knows? I mean, I might be um, at some point. 
but I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in like the different like goals that one might have fish keeping, like actually acquiring these aquariums was kind of an interesting process for me because I got to meet like all of these different kinds of fish keepers and they all seem to have like varying um, moral relationships to fish keeping as well as varying intentions like some fish keepers where like you would see some of their other aquariums and you're just sort of like questioning it <laughs> or, or you, I would buy like tanks and they would come with like a setup that seemed to be like dedicated completely to like high-tech aquatic plant growing systems or like this one was uh, all set up for African chicklids. It oh, came wow. with like a lot of accessories for that. So um, it's kind of been interesting. I, I've been using Craigslist a lot to like acquire a lot of these materials and you really like pick up on, on what like specific fish keepers mindsets are just by like the hardware. Um, so that, that's been kind of revealing for me. As, as well as like personal connections kind of play a, a big role in this. Like, you know, I'll have friends who will donate like a tank or something just because they don't want it anymore. Or, um, you know, a faculty member gave me like some fish and I took them gladly. So it, it's, nice. kind of, it's kind of interesting. And I've, I've been selling Marimo over the week. <laughs> to gallery attendees. Selling art. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's been kind of fun. I mean, I also have other things in the gallery, like I have little, little prints that sort of, these are kind of more like jokes, I guess you could say. Um, can't really see it in the light. But that one says, have sex once, pregnant for life. And it describes the ram's horn snails and, um, they're, they are hermaphrodites, and so once they have sex with one another, they carry that genetic material with them, and they're able to self-fertilize and produce offspring at will. So if one of these snails has ever been around another stale snail, it's potentially pregnant for life. Wow. So, yeah. Michael Nannery, congratulations. Thanks. And thanks for chatting. <laughs> it's been fun.